angels waging war in the unseen realm. Global events fulfilling biblical prophecy. Eternal life. What lies beyond mortality? From analyzing the paranormal from a biblical worldview to the discussion of cutting edge science and technology, conspiracy, discovery, special investigative reports. Unafraid to explore the challenging issues facing humanity. Welcome to another edition of Skywatch TV. The key to understanding the future, end times prophecy in particular, hinges on a covenant, a deal that was cut in the desert, literally, 4,000 years ago. Welcome to Skywatch TV. I'm Derek Gilbert in studio with my best friend, my wife, Sharon K. Gilbert, and the author of a new book. Uh, he's the author of a number of important books for your reference library, The Islamic Antichrist, Mideast Beast, uh, co-author of God's War on Terror, and the new book, When a Jew Rules the World. It is our honor to welcome Joel Richardson back to Skywatch TV. Joel? Derek, great th to be back. This uh, really is intriguing, and, and I, I think many of us in the 21st century with our Western modern worldview kind of balk at the idea that something that happened with the guy who was essentially a, a wealthy shepherd <laughs> 4,000 years ago is key to understanding what will happen in the future. Uh, explain, what is the Abrahamic Covenant and why does it matter to us in the 21st century? Yeah, that's a great question. Well, I mean, when you go back to the very foundation of the Bible, you go back to the Abrahamic Covenant, you have the story where God appears to Abraham, uh, you know, pulls him out of Ur of Chaldees, and he basically makes a promise to him. And the Lord actually, we talked about it last program, he actually had Abraham cut these animals in half, and he makes this path down the middle. The Lord walks down this path and promises to Abraham to give him and his descendants, his seed, his uh, Zerah, to give them this particular piece of land in the Middle East that we call Israel, but it's actually much bigger than Israel. He defines it very clearly. And God, by the way, by, by demonstrating this walking down this aisle of these animals cut in half, he was essentially saying that may I die if I don't keep my promises. Mm -hmm. So you begin with the foundation of the Bible is that God promised to Abraham's descendants to give them the promised land. Mm -hmm. Once we understand that, we can look out at the earth and understand how so many of the events that are unfolding today in the news, the constellation of the nations, it's all essentially Satan's effort to thwart and come against the Abrahamic covenant. Hmm. Uh, sadly, the church has been guilty of ignoring, downplaying, or rejecting the idea that the Abrahamic covenant still has any validity today. Right. Um, what is replacement theology and what are the implications of replacement theology? Sure. Well, first of all, what we need to understand is that in the early church, you had these um, conflicting um, worldviews. You had the Greek Hellenistic worldview. Uh, in North Africa, you had the city of Alexandria. This was a hot spot for trying to indoctrinate people with a Hellenistic worldview. And many of these Hellenists embraced Christianity, and then they tried to merge the two. Mm -hmm. uh, and so Hellenistic worldview, Greek philosophy basically says that the physical realm is bad and that the spiritual realm is good. So there is this desire to sort of do away with this idea that God's ultimate plan and purpose is to give his people a piece of land. Mm -hmm. Why would you want a piece of land? Yeah. You know, the goal is to shed this shell, this old dying shell and become pure spirit. That's Gnosticism, essentially. That's Gnosticism. And, you know, Greek philosophy to Gnosticism, it's a spectrum, but it's all emanating from the same worldview. Um, and so basically the early church, as it was as it was corrupted by Greek philosophy, it started doing away with the gospel story, hmm. which says that God's plan was to put his spirit in us so that we could, in a resurrected body, we could obey him perfectly and serve the king, the, the Jewish king, Jesus, that would hmm. rule over the earth from the promised land. And so we started spiritualizing all of the promises in the Old Testament. And so we spiritualized away Israel. It, when we use the term spiritualize, it basically means do away with it. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. Mm -hmm. We spiritualized the temple, we spiritualized the promised land, and we spiritualized Israel. And we said, we are the new and true Israel. The promised land of the Old Testament, that's heaven. 
And so we kind of created this Greek corrupted, let's call it Christoplatonism. It was sort of hmm. Plato's philosophy mixed with Christianity, hmm. but it was not biblical. Hmm. Well, in order to believe that, you have to do away with a lot of prophetic uh, passages in the Bible, not the least of which is talking about the tribulation period and the millennial kingdom. Yeah. Yeah, when you look at, I mean, one of the, I'll say, the Achilles heels of those that hold to replacement theology, it's Daniel 11 and 12. And we have to remember that that chapter breaks not in the original, uh, you know, that was added in the medieval period, but really right there at, at chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, you have uh, this, this angel, this interpreting angel tying in the events of the Antichrist that were just described in chapter 11, and tying that time, he says, at that time, Michael the archangel will stand up mm -hmm. uh, and defend your people. And he ties it into the resurrection of the dead. He says, all of those that sleep in the dust of the earth will arise and shout for joy. So you have the resurrection of the dead, hasn't happened yet, tied into the great tribulation. And so many of these guys that are pla embrace replacement theology, that what they also do is they embrace a position called preterism, mm. which says that all prophecy is past. You see, the scriptures say that in the last days before the return of Jesus, all the nations gather against Israel. Well, what sense would it make to have all the nations gather against Israel if God's done with Israel? And so the bottom, this is simple logic. We can look at the news today and say, if God's done with Israel, Satan hasn't received the memo and it's time to wake up and show a little bit of discernment. Mm. You mentioned preterism, uh, which is one view of interpreting prophecy, and you also mentioned the millennial reign. Mm -hmm. So l let's, let's get into the definitions then of the various positions, uh, premillennial, postmillennial, amillennial. Mm -hmm. How do they differ? Sure. And again, what role does uh, this rejection, replacement theology, play yeah. in, in, in picking one of those worldviews or one of those interpretations? Okay. So the earliest believers, all of the early church writers, the apostles, they were pre-millennialists. What that means is that Jesus returns previous to, before the millennium. The mm -hmm. millennium is this thousand year period. And it doesn't have to be a literal thousand years. I believe it is. But it's a, it's a long time period that the prophets describe when Jesus will rule the nations from Jerusalem. All the promises made to the Jewish people will be fulfilled. A Jew will rule the world. That's Jesus from Jerusalem. That's premillennialism. Jesus returns, rules for a thousand years. Then as the early church rejected the, the, the idea that God's still dealing with Israel, then they embraced what's called amillennialism. Ah simply means no, none. And so they rejected the idea of a millennium and they spiritualized it. And they said, now we're living in the millennium. This is the millennium. This is the church age. Okay. Now in modern times, uh, basically you had the, the 70s and the 80s, you know, all these people were being swept in to the church through the Jesus movement and everybody mm -hmm. was reading. Hal Lindsey's book, The Late Great Planet Earth. Yes. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. they were looking out at the nations and they were saying, Israel just became a nation. The Bible predicted that. They recognized the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. They read Hal's book and they got the, you know what, scared out of them. Yeah, they yeah. came into the church. I mean, the Lord used that book. Mm -hmm. But then what happened is you had Edgar Wisenant's 88 Reasons the Rapture Will Happen in 88. Right. And, and, and while Lindsay certainly didn't say the rapture was going to happen, he, you know, you had countdown uh, I was called Armageddon countdown or uh, 1980s countdown to Armageddon. Mm -hmm. So there was just many in the church that very strongly thought 1988 was going to be the time that Jesus was going to return and what happened. And again, I, I lay that at the feet of men like Ed Edgar Wisenant who made dogmatic predictions. What happened is in the decades that followed, many within the church rejected Bible prophecy altogether. They turned off. They said, we got burnt by that disappointment. And this is when many started embracing what's called post-millennialism. Mm -hmm. Post-millennialism is this triumphalistic, dominionistic um, version of amillennialism, which really says that we as the church, so, so the post-millennialists looked at the pre-millennialists and they said, you guys are too pessimistic. Yeah. You say everything's getting worse. You guys are just waiting for the rapture. You're not engaging culture and society. You're defeatists. You're defeatists. Why polish the brass on a sinking ship and all these sort of things. And you know, sometimes, sometimes some pre-millennials have been guilty of that. But then this is what Christians always do or 
humans always do, is the pendulum swings in the opposite direction. We overreact, and so we embrace this thing called post-millennialism, which says, no, it's not pessimistic. It's all optimistic. Jesus died on the cross for our sins. We're going to win, win, win. We're going to take over the whole world. We're going to cause the whole world to be a Christian. We're going to take dominion. And so that's post-millennialism. It's the idea that we establish the millennium on the earth, that mm -hmm. the body of Christ is responsible. We do the heavy lifting, and then we sort of hand it over to Jesus. Yeah, so, he comes back. Uh, it's, it's a, there's a misinterpretation of, uh, I believe it's Psalm 110, verse 1. Uh, the Lord said to my Lord, you know, remain at my right hand until I put, make your enemies a footstool under right. your feet. Yeah. Uh, ignores several New Testament verses that say that's already happened. Um, but it is borderline heretical, assuming that mm -hmm. we, the church, are going to take over and actually somehow defeat sin and death. Yeah, it's, it's arrogance, again. It's, At it's least. typical Gentile arrogance. It's thoroughly unbiblical. It requires complete violence, that we commit violence to so many of the Old Testament prophecies and just flip them on their head and distort them. The hermeneutical, exegetical work that goes into um, supporting post-millennialism is it's, it's fraudulent. I mean, it, there's no foundation there. Yeah. Um, but it appeals, again, to the young generation that says, I want to be involved and engaged in culture. Right. And, and look, I fully support that. I believe that as a premillennialist, that we need to be engaged in culture. But Jesus does the heavy lifting. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm not under any illusion that it's my job to save the world. I'm going to save as many along the way as I can. I'm going to rescue as many as I can. I'm going to minister to the poor along the way. But in doing so... All of these little acts, I'm pointing to the coming kingdom when the poor are cared for, when the enslaved will be set free, and I'm pointing to, with my words and my life, the coming kingdom. And so I'm proclaiming the gospel with my life, but I'm not under the illusion that I'm going to take over the world. I was just listening to um, you know, a teaching from one of these post-millennialists recently. And what they actually do is they say, once you establish a Christian society, then you have to establish uh, laws that are based on the Mosaic laws. And he mm -hmm. actually is mm -hmm. coming right out and saying, we need to institute the death penalty for homosexuals. That's Christian yeah. reconstructionism. Yeah. yeah, now look. Christian Sharia. I, I joke around. It's Christian Sharia. Well, I want to go back to something. I grew up in the Stone Age in the church. And back then, <laughs> the, the early tel television preachers were talking about kingdom now. How is that the same or different from post-millennialism? Is it the same? Yeah, basically kingdom now, dominionism, reconstructionism, theonomy, these are all basically the same terms. Now, many today embrace a theology which they'll say it's now and not yet, which really is an oxymoron. How can mm -hmm. it be now and not yeah. yet? Mm -hmm. But they'll say, well, he inaugurated his kingdom. This is after the work of George Eldon Ladd. Let me just say this. There's a spectrum to which, to what degree do you believe the kingdom is sort of spiritually now versus it yet to come? I would say that the overwhelming emphasis of the scriptures are on the fact that the kingdom is yet to come. Mm -hmm. Now, to the degree that we believe the kingdom is now, we will relate to the cross like a vending machine. When we are on that end of the spectrum where we say the kingdom is primarily now, we relate to the cross like it's a genie. Mm -hmm. And it's all just to give me my victory and my blessings right. and I'm guaranteed to be healed, guaranteed. And if you're not rich, it's because you have secret sin. If you're sick, it's because you have unconfessed sin, whatever. To the degree that you believe the kingdom is yet to come, you will embrace the cross as as something to be imitated. It's, a, it's something to be embraced. It's suffering before glory. And I would argue that is the New Testament biblical model, mm -hmm. that we are called to imitate Jesus as aliens and strangers here. Now, as we influence the world as salt and light, but that's, we use the word influence as salt and light while maintaining a pilgrim identity. Once we use the word conquer, mm -hmm. we've crossed into thoroughly unbiblical territory. You're not very popular. <laughs> You're not going to bring in a whole church load of people with stuff like that. When you preach the cross, you'll have smaller crowds, mm -hmm. but they'll have deeper roots. Amen. And I'm happy with that. Yeah. Amen. No, that, that is, um, I, I think, spot on. Um, there, there is a certain uh, element of, of uh, our, our natural selves that, that want to believe that yeah. we're going to be victorious and that we're going to yeah. you know, kick, kick the tar out of, of, of the enemy today. But it, it does not, uh, it, it's not consistent with what we can observe in right. reality. Yeah. The, this worldview, the premillennial worldview, is reality-based and yes. is testable. Um, 
the, the implications, again, of, of replacement theology, uh, it, it seems to me, and, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the proper biblical view is that there are three groups of people, the church, those who have accepted Christ, the uh, unbelieving world, Gentiles, if you will, and then the Jews. Mm -hmm. And however they try to slice it, um, post-millennialism, replacement theology, cuts it down to two groups of people. There's us and there's everybody else. And the Jews are part of that everybody else who need to be conquered. So what are the implications when we follow this to its logical conclusion, replacement theology? Yeah. And the thing of it is, is there is only one people of God, which is Jew and Gentile together. Yes. So that's mm -hmm. true on right. one hand. Yeah, Ephesians 2, Paul described it as one new man. Mm -hmm. Right. But on the other hand, there is still something that Paul refers to as uh, Israel after the flesh. So there is still somebody called Israel, and though the majority are unbelieving, there's many messianic believers there, but there still remains on this distinct group, based on the promises of Abraham, a yet future calling and election. And so there's a day coming when Jesus returns, it says in Zechariah 12, they will look upon the one they've pierced, and they will all turn to him, Paul tells us in Romans 11, that all Israel will be saved on that day. And then Paul goes on to quote Isaiah 59, which leads right into Isaiah 60, which talks about the glories of the restored Jewish kingdom. So clearly, God still has a purpose with Israel. Now, what are the implications? What are the implications of the church if we don't get this right? Mm -hmm. Well, the bottom line is we haven't got it right throughout most of our history. Mm -hmm. The church has got it wrong. And there is something that I call the dangerous logic of replacement theology. And that is once you come to the conclusion that God is done with his people, and not only is he done with them, he's purposefully removed them from the land and he's punished them forever. He's dissolved them as a people. Right. That that's his purpose. The logic is this, once you say that's God's will, and I wanna be a servant of God's will, then you begin trying to actually participate with what you believe is God's punishment of Israel. This is exactly what the church has done, done down through history. You have statements by John Chrysostom. He says this, he says, because God hates the Jews, we should hate them and yearn for their blood. And you go, well, that's just John Chrysostom. You know, he, this is, he was, you know, Protestants will say, well, he was kind of part of the Eastern Orthodox Catholic Church and we're Protestants. So, we, we, but then you have Martin Luther. Yeah. Yes. And you open chapter one with this quote, and I was going to read this and ask if people could guess, but you've already tipped their hat, ah, but sorry. still this, no, that's all right. But this is, this is shocking because I knew that Luther held anti-Semitic views, but I didn't realize that he'd actually wrote, and, and I'll quote now, what then shall we Christians do with this damned, rejected race of the Jews? First, their synagogues should be set on fire, and whatever does not burn up should be covered or spread over with dirt so that no one may ever be able to see a cinder or stone of it. And this ought to be done in the, for the honor of God and, and of Christianity in order that God may see that we are Christians. Secondly, their homes should likewise be broken down and destroyed, for they per perpetuate the same things, per perpetrate the same things there that they do in their synagogues. And he goes on. Basically, basically saying they should be killed, their homes destroyed, their churches, their synagogues destroyed, and we should do this for the glory of God because we are Christians. Right. That is shocking. Yeah, yeah. He actually says, let them be driven out of our nation as, as mad, like raving dogs. The bottom line is the foundation that the church laid with writings like this from Luther, Christostom, really every major church leader down through history you can point to has made not always as quite as violent, hateful statements, but strong statements. We laid the foundation, whether we want to admit it or not, for the Holocaust. Hmm. When Hitler came along, he drew from the words of Martin Luther. And the bottom line is we as the church corporately have blood on our hands. And if we want to stand before him on that day, the day of judgment with clean hands, yes, it's the blood of Jesus will wash us, but we need to repent of our sins and take responsibility for our historical actions. If we want to reach the Jewish people, it requires repenting of this theology, which leads to that type of hatred. Paul says the gospel is to the Jew first. It's especially to the Jew. And we have mm -hmm. this special obligation to proclaim as Gentiles that have received this grace of God to proclaim the gospel to the Jewish people. And we can't do that if we continue to hold on to this damnable doctrine of replacement theology or supersessionism. Amen. Mm -hmm. You have a phrase that was brand new to me, Islamic supersessionism. What is that? Well, I mean, you know, again, the church, supersessionism is just another term for replacement theology, the idea that we've superseded, we're mm -hmm. replaced Israel, and the land's been replaced, and the temple's been replaced, and all these things. 
when Muhammad came along, the founder of this new desert pirate cult, which is basically what it was, he was rubbing elbows with Christians in Arabia, and they were supersessionists. They embraced replacement theology because pretty much everyone did. All the church did at that time. Yeah, Israel didn't even exist, so it was kind of easy to do at that point. Yeah. And so what did Muhammad do? He was a very innovative cult leader, like most cult leaders are. And he looked at the Christians. He said, okay, so you guys are saying that you replace the Jews. And he goes, okay, well, I replace you and the Jews. The Muslims replace both you and the Jews. But then Muhammad added a much more militant, um, violent, aggressive, active element to that. And as a result today, what do we have? We have our Christian brothers and sisters throughout the Middle East being beheaded, being wiped out, being driven out of the Middle East. Uh, after Muhammad's followers burst forth out of Arabia, within 100 years, 50% of global Christendom was wiped out. The ancient heart of the church was wiped out. And I hate to use this, this term, but Christianity's replacement theology chickens came home to roost. Mm. And the theology that we created against the Jews came back to bite us. Mm. How is, um, that, because we see in, in news, uh, news reports uh, periodically, you know, one church denomination or another uh, voting to divest mm. all of its uh, investments in uh, any company that has anything to do with Israel. Um, how else are we seeing this, this replacement theology manifest itself in Christianity? Yeah. Well, again, the past 200 years, there was a trending in the church where much of the church was returning to the Bible, reading it literally and rejecting replacement theology. In more recent years, we're seeing a trending back in the other direction. We're seeing many of the seminaries. We're seeing many of the younger Christians. We're seeing many of the mainline denominations embracing a very political movement, a pro-Palestinian movement, which then becomes staunchly anti-Israel. And, you know, we're seeing statements coming out of some of the mainline denominations, signing documents, writing these various uh, works that are renouncing Israel, that are what, what, what many don't realize is that there are very strong Islamist racist organization lobby groups behind a lot of these things. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, you have a lot of young Christians because it's all cast in the name of, of justice and tolerance and, and love for the Palestinian. And God loves the Palestinian people as much as he loves the Jewish people. But we need to approach them all with the gospel. And so you have all these young Christians that, that believe they're involved in justice. They don't realize they are putting their canoes in a river of hatred that ultimately leads to the nation surrounding Israel and trying to carry out a final genocide. And again, we need to recognize what we're being involved in, mm -hmm. repent of it. And one of the big issues that I keep saying, trumpeting, is saying every seminary throughout the United States must have mandatory classes where they study the history of the Christian mistreatment of the Jewish people. My wife's teaching right now uh, in high school, she's teaching church history. She's going through a few books. None of them really detail what mm. we've done to the Jewish people. The Jews are aware of it. Sure. But yeah. the church has basically forgotten about it. We need to teach it to our children. When we do that, teach it to the seminary students. When we do that, I think replacement theology will dry up and go away. Mm. Sadly, we're living in a time um, in a postmodern world where feelings, emotions are more important to how people shape their worldview. Than, than actual doctrine, than actual fact. Right. And so the, uh, the clear scriptural teaching, the unconditional promises that God made to the Jews, to his chosen people through Abraham, through David, yeah. uh, are, are forgotten yeah. because of a few images that we find or YouTube videos that we find mm -hmm. that, yeah. that sway our emotions, pull our emotions in a particular well, direction. Well, and I think all too often we're getting our doctrine from YouTube videos yes. instead of going directly to the word and studying it in a systematic way, which many families need to do. Yeah, All absolutely. families need to do. Chuck Mistler calls this book an essential read for any Christian. It is When a Jew Rules the World by Joel Richardson. We'd like to offer this to you for $26.95 is the list price, $26.95 plus shipping and handling. But as a bonus, a $30 value, the books of the Apocrypha. This is a two-handed book, uh, <laughs> an essential part of your reference library. We will add this at no additional charge, this $30 value. When you order Joel Richardson's book, When a Jew Rules the World from Skywatch TV store, Dot com. That's skywatchtvstore.com. Uh, Joel, with just about a minute to go, uh, what do you hope is the takeaway from readers of the book, When It Jew Rules the World? Well, I hope that those that were being swayed by replacement theology will repent and recognize that it's unbiblical, it's dangerous and hurtful, and that people will wake up to realize that the events unfolding in the earth right now 
we can clearly see the hand of Satan coming against the promised plan of God. We want to be on the right side of history. We want to trumpet the gospel to all creation. We want to rescue as many out of the fire as possible. Amen. A proper understanding of history and of what is to come begins with a covenant made in the desert 4,000 years ago. Joel Richardson, Sharon Gilbert. I'm Derek Gilbert. Thank you for watching as we keep watch. This is Skywatch TV. Here at Skywatch TV, we discuss a lot of cutting edge theological concepts. In fact, some think we've gone over the edge with some of the things we discussed. But the truth is, we build on the work of giants. One such is George Hawkins Pember. G.H. Pember was an English theologian in the 19th century who saw the return of the days of Noah in the rise of spiritualism, the theosophical movement, concepts that form the basis of the New Age movement, which is influencing evangelical churches in America today. He wrote a lot about prophecy, not common in that era. But again, a lot of the things that Pember saw coming, we're seeing the fruit of today in our 21st century world. Most of Pember's works are out of print and those that have been reprinted are often heavily edited. It's not unusual, not uncommon, not unheard of for a first edition work by Pember to sell for as much as $1,500. For the first time, Defender Publishing has collected the classic works of George Hawkins Pember under a single cover. The G.H. Pember collection, including his classic work, Earth's Earliest Ages, available for the first time in one volume from Defender Publishing. It's $29.95 plus shipping and handling. This is an invaluable resource for your reference library. The G.H. Pember Collection, $29.95 plus shipping and handling from the Skywatch TV store. Available online at skywatchtvstore.com. The supernatural realm is real, and we humans are naturally curious about it. That's why there are so many television reality shows featuring ghost hunters and alien chasers and mediums and psychics. Now, by definition, we Christians believe in the supernatural. And yet most churches avoid these controversial topics. Our mission here at Skywatch TV is to address these topics of the paranormal and the supernatural from a biblical perspective. This is, after all, the authoritative book on the subject. But we depend on your help to do it. To find out more on how you can support Skywatch TV, prayerfully and financially, log on to our website, skywatchtv.com. Our mission also to keep you informed through news items we think are important and the latest news updates about Skywatch TV. You can follow those on the internet, Facebook, Twitter, Google+, various other places. And of course, all of our programs, if you can't watch them live, are archived at our website and our official YouTube channel. You can find all the places where you can see Skywatch TV and follow us on the internet at skywatchtv.com slash web. And, of course, you can watch our programming anytime, day or night, on demand through Roku. For instructions on how to add our Roku channel to your Roku account, log on to skywatchtv.com slash Roku. And keep watching as we keep watch at Skywatch TV. Thank you for watching. Skywatch TV is a viewer-supported ministry. Your tax-deductible donation and your purchases at skywatchtvstore.com make it possible to produce our unique reports on prophecy, discovery, and the supernatural. Please follow us online at Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. You'll find those links at our website, skywatchtv.com.